So the indeterminates seem to get promoted a lot more for whatever reason, and I think that's why most people end up choosing them, although they might not be the best choice for their situation. What's up, Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a fantastic day. It is Friday, February 17th here in South Georgia. Kind of a wet day, getting pretty chilly out here. Got a cool spell coming through tonight, and it's supposed to get up in the mid 80s next week. So on today's video, we're gonna get out of this cool windy weather a little bit, go in the greenhouse there and continue along with our spring seed starting schedule, get our determinate tomatoes planted. We're gonna talk a little bit about determinate versus indeterminate tomatoes. And then we're gonna sneak back outside here and talk a little bit about rust. So as far as our seed starting progress goes, we've got one tray over here with mostly indeterminate tomatoes. Almost all those have popped. We've got a few on the end there that were planted just a few days ago, still waiting on them. We've got some really good germination with those. If we zoom in here real close, we can see a few of those are starting to put on their second set of leaves or what we call true leaves. So we'll need to start fertilizing those puppies there pretty soon then we've got a tray of peppers here starting to see some good germination here our king arthur peppers are finally popping through there got good germination on our santa fe grand this pueblo variety hasn't really germinated yet don't know if we got a bad pack of seeds on those or if we just need to wait longer and some of these hotter peppers it's going to take them probably another week before they start popping so once we start seeing that second set of leaves or true leaves consistently kind of across the entire tray that's when we'll start giving them a little juice here with our fertilizer injector when we're not fertilizing we can just easily switch that off and then when we want to fertilize we can switch it back on we'll be running some of that good agar thrive general purpose through there so a few weeks ago when we kind of laid out our spring seed starting schedule i told you we were going to do those indeterminate tomatoes first in early february because i like to go in the ground with a larger plant on those and plant them pretty deep and then around the middle of february which is where we are now we're going to plant our determinate tomatoes in here because we'll plant those straight from these prop tech trays into the ground we don't need a very large plug or a very large plant with those and so today we're going to be planting my favorites red snapper and roadster and then somewhere in the mix i kind of forgot about the cherry tomatoes so we need to get those planted as well today got two varieties of those we'll be starting too now before we plant these let's talk a little bit about determinate versus indeterminate tomato varieties because i think this is an area where a lot of beginner gardeners mess up or make the wrong decision as far as picking what tomato varieties they're going to grow so if you go to a big box store or hardware store to buy tomato plants, you're probably going to find mostly indeterminate varieties. Even down here in the south where indeterminate varieties don't do as well. That's just the types that these places tend to sell the most. Also, if you go online to buy seeds, most of the varieties that these seed companies are carrying are indeterminate varieties. So the indeterminates seem to get promoted a lot more for whatever reason, and I think that's why most people end up choosing them, although they might not be the best choice for their situation. And the reason for that is that indeterminate tomato plants are not indeterminate everywhere. They're certainly not indeterminate down here. Tomato plants don't really like temperatures above 90 degrees. That's when they start suffering a little bit. And so down here, our indeterminate tomatoes are usually toast come early to mid July. Depends on the year. Sometimes we can stretch it towards the end of July, but they're done. They're not growing all the way to your first frost like they will in the middle of the country or the northern part of the country. So indeterminate tomatoes, especially in areas with milder summers, are going to give you a nice slow drip kind of continual production from when you plant. They start producing all the way until your first frost date. Determinate tomatoes, on the other hand, are going to give you a lot of production in a really small window and then they're done. So if you live in an area like we do where it's hot and humid in the summer and you have a pretty short tomato growing season, you may want to consider growing determinates versus indeterminates. You're not going to get a lot of bang for your buck with the indeterminate varieties, but with the determinates you can because you're going to get so much more production within that small window you have. 
Now another advantage to growing determinate tomatoes in my opinion is if you do a lot of canning or preservation. Now, we put up a lot of pasta sauce and stewed tomatoes and if you're doing that you need to have a certain amount of tomatoes to get all your canning stuff out. You don't want to just make one or two jars. You want to make I don't know 10 or 20 jars if you're going to get all your canning stuff out. Since the determinate tomatoes make so much at one time it's nice to go out there and pick a couple buckets of tomatoes and then, you know, can 20 jars of them. If you've only got indeterminates out there and you're only getting a few tomatoes at the time, you would need a lot more plants to get the same amount of tomatoes to do your canning or preservation. Now, the other thing to consider here is plant maintenance. Determinate tomatoes are so much easier than indeterminate tomatoes. So with indeterminate tomatoes, you're going to want to prune those and they're going to get really, really tall. You're going to need a much larger trellis for the indeterminate tomatoes. The determinate tomatoes, you don't have to prune those. They actually do much better when you don't prune them. And you don't need a very big trellis. They're only gonna get four, maybe five foot tall. Now the plants will get pretty heavy. You need something sturdy, but you don't need a huge tall trellis for those. So just to kind of summarize all that, if you live in the middle of the country or the northern part of the country where it doesn't get that hot during the summer and you want that kind of slow drip, continual production all throughout the warm season, indeterminates are the way to go for you. If you live down here in the south and you know experience the short tomato growing season that we have determinants may give you more bang for your buck and if you do a lot of canning i think determinants are the way to go because you can get so many more tomatoes at one time off a given plant now obviously we grow both we've got a whole tray of indeterminate tomatoes over here about to start a whole tray of determinate tomatoes so they both have a place in our garden but we really count on the determinate tomato production for our canning, for our pasta sauces, things of that nature. If I were to only grow indeterminate tomatoes, I would have to grow a lot more plants and it would take up a lot more space in my garden. So let's get some of these determinate tomatoes started here. I've already pre-moistened this tray right here. Came out here yesterday, did that. Went ahead and got it on the heat mat so the soil could be nice and warm when we plant here in a minute. Had to add another heat mat to my setup here. Have one down that way. And with these sun pad mats, you just kind of daisy chain them together. So each mat doesn't have to be plugged into an outlet. This mat only has to be plugged into the mat that's in front of it. So that's a pretty nice way to have it kind of set up there. Now with these red snapper and roaster varieties, I only need about 15 plants. I'm going to do one 30 foot row of each two foot spacing along the row, so 15 plants. But I'm gonna go ahead and use all the seeds in my packet because we usually have plenty of people wanting some tomato plants. So we're doing 50 seeds. We need five of these lanes here per variety. And then we'll stick our cherry tomatoes here on the end. Probably just grow a couple, you know, lanes in this tray of those. I only need one or two plants of each variety. I surely don't need 15 cherry tomatoes. So we're going to start dropping these in the cells and I'm going to try to just get one seed per cell. I expect these to germinate pretty well. So no need to double plant these. And whereas with some cheap seeds, if I accidentally drop two in there, I usually don't fish them out. These seeds are a good bit more pricey. So if I do accidentally drop two, I will get it out of there and put it in a different cell. All right, so there's a lot more than 50 seeds in that red snapper and roadster packet there. Looks like it was closer to about 63 seeds. So kind of pushed us down the tray a little bit, but that's all right. I wanted to go ahead and use all those in the packet there because we can surely get rid of them. Now we need to go to our cherry tomatoes. Got this variety here called Edox that I've never tried, but the picture made it look like something I need to try. We've had a few viewers have told me they've grown this variety and that it was really, really good. So I'm super, super excited about trying this one. And then the second cherry variety we have here is this Torangina that we grew last year. Couldn't have been happier with it. And I would say if you've ever grown Sun Gold or Sun Sugar, any of those orange cherry tomato varieties and like those, I would almost guarantee that you'll like 
Torangina better. Now the seeds are a little more pricey for it, but it blew me away last year and uh, significantly better than Sun Gold in my opinion. It doesn't crack near as bad. The description on the website says the plants are a little more compact and they are. They're not compact to the extent that a determinate tomato is. They just don't quite sprawl all over the place like a sun gold will. That's a really, really productive cherry tomato, really tasty one too. So after planting all those, I've got one lane left here and I've got something special to go in there. And before we plant it, I'll tell you all about it. Now, if you've been paying attention and you got a really good memory, you may remember last year there was an indeterminate tomato we planted from seeds that a viewer sent us called Turkey Creek. Now we planted it kind of late, didn't get a ton of tomatoes from it until the heat kind of zapped it in the middle of summer but the few tomatoes we got were really really good and i cut one open on a video and told you guys that it was probably the best tasting tomato that we grew last year now we've had quite a few of you asking where you can get your hands on some of these turkey creek tomato seeds and fortunately mike sent me a good many here way more than i'm going to need now we got to get these packed they're not on the website yet but hopefully within the next week they will be right there in the same section with those other few seed varieties that we have on the website so i'm going to plant one lane of these which will give me nine plants i'll probably only plant about three or four of these plants i can't wait to try some of these again and then like we always do we need to give them a little go dogs perlite here just to top them off if you're buying perlite make sure you get dogs perlite that other stuff just won't work as well as this stuff here all right, now that we're back on schedule with our seed starting, let's talk about rust, specifically as it relates to fig trees. And the reason I wanna talk about this is just based on a few questions we've been getting from folks who have ordered fig trees from us and have gotten them in the mail already. So if you've ever grown beans or peas, you've probably seen rust on your bean or pea plants. It's a fungus and it's pretty easy to identify because it looks just like rust. So see that leaf right there? That's rust. Now there are three things in our lives that are inevitable. Death, taxes, and rust on fig trees. Fig trees get rust, that's just what they do. All fig trees get it, doesn't really hurt them, but it's just something that happens every single year. They'll get rust on the leaves, those leaves will fall off, the trees will put on new leaves that are green, eventually those leaves might get rust, but it doesn't affect the fruit production of the plant, doesn't affect the quality of the fruit. It's just kind of a cosmetic thing. So all the trees in our orchard get rust every single year, but it doesn't hurt anything. We still get lots of delicious figs off our trees. Now down here where we are, where it's hot and humid, we probably get rust worse than areas with milder summers that are maybe a little bit north of us. But the figs are going to be the same whether the tree has rust or not. Now from my experiences in our orchard and my plant propagation efforts, some varieties seem to be more prone to rust than others. Like I said, it doesn't hurt the plants, but let's take for example this Canadria tree here versus this white Marcel tree. This Canadria tree's got a little rust on it. Those bottom leaves are probably gonna fall off pretty soon. Not gonna hurt anything. But this white Marcel tree here, not the first speck of rust on it. Now, I've yet to find anything written down or documented online that talks about varieties that are more resistant or more susceptible to rust, but I've seen it firsthand in our orchard and our greenhouse. For some reason, white Marcells doesn't seem to get it as bad. So if you get a fig tree in the mail from us and it loses some of these bottom leaves here, nothing to worry about. As long as this new growth here, this new stem is green, you're good to go and keep putting on new leaves. It is perfectly normal for them to shed some of these smaller leaves here as they grow. Now I've told you that the rust is mainly just a cosmetic thing, nothing to worry about, not going to hurt the tree, but what if you want to worry about it? Well, like I said, you can't eliminate rust completely. You can mitigate rust a little bit by doing what we call a dormant spray on the trees. Now ideally, I would have liked to have already sprayed my trees, but they started putting on leaves way early this year. I hope we don't get a bad late frost and it stunts some of that new growth there. But you can use a dormant spray on the trees before they put on leaves and while they've got some new leaves forming there. You don't want to spray fig trees when they got fruit on them. It's not recommended to spray the fruit, but you can spray the trees 
while they're dormant or while they're just putting on leaves now. So I usually use this stuff right here, this Captain Jack's fruit tree spray. I think this has neem oil in it. There's another one I saw at Tractor Supply. I think the same company makes it, but it's called Dormant Fruit Tree Spray and it has mineral oil in it. Either of those would work. You could also use copper if you wanted to go that route. Several different options. And what that will do, spraying the wood on the trees now before they put on a bunch of leaves, will reduce the amount of rust you're gonna have. Not gonna eliminate completely, but if you wanna kinda you know, control the amount of rust you have, that's a good way to do it. So I'll probably spray the trees in my orchard with this stuff right here in the next few days if I can catch a good window of dry weather. But I don't spray these young trees that we ship out. They get a little bit of rust on them. I just don't worry about it because I know they're gonna be all right. I don't really wanna spray these young trees. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. Good to get more seeds started. And hopefully that answered some of your questions about rust on fig trees and what you can do about it. And real quick, back to our little discussion in the greenhouse area of determinant versus indeterminate tomatoes. Let me know in the comments below if you've got any additional pros and cons of growing determinant versus growing indeterminate tomatoes. And as always, you can find links to our affiliate partners in the description below. Got some coupon codes for some of those companies so you can take advantage of those discounts. Don't forget to go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where we've got all these beautiful fig trees listed there, available for purchase. Got a few seeds as well. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well, mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life.